welcome. Welcome. This is the kickoff for our summer series, Featured Artists and Conversations, and I'm so happy that you're here. I'm Nancy Wilhelms. I'm the Executive Director of Anderson Ranch. And I would like to thank presenting sponsor, Toby Lewis, for stepping forward as a lead sponsor to help make this series in our Visiting Artists Program possible. Toby, thank you so much. I'd also like to thank our National Council sponsors who accepted Toby's challenge, as well as our corporate and media partners and other supporters. Thank you all so much. <laughs> now I'd like to give a nod to Sharon Hoffman, who will introduce our speaker today. Sharon and her husband John have been deeply involved in our summer series and many programs at Anderson Ranch They've been helping to bring important artists to the ranch for many, many years. They're always there for us. Please welcome Sharon. I also want to thank you for attending this opening presentation of the summer series here at the ranch. It is my special pleasure to introduce you to our first featured artist for the summer, Titus Kafar whom we are grateful to have at the ranch as we celebrate 50 years at the forefront of art making and ideas in art. Titus was born in Kalamazoo, Michigan and currently works and lives in New Haven, Connecticut. A graduate of the MFA program at Yale, he has been shown and collected nationally and he is represented by the Jack Shaneman Gallery in New York City. Kafar is the very first recipient of the Gwendolyn Knight and Jacob Lawrence Fellowship, an award given to a distinguished early career black artist who reflects the culture, history, and values of artists of color. And a very recent recipient, I think in the last week, of the Creative Capital and Rauschenberg Grants. Kafar said, I think we in the art world often struggle to figure out what efficacy the works actually have beyond just the pleasure of our experience. What can the work actually do? Well, through his work, Gafar has reconnected with his estranged father, collaborated with youth impacted by the criminal justice system, and has taken part in discussions with artists, policymakers, and activists to create the change of which his work speaks. By recontextualizing familiar imagery, such as the Founding Fathers or Golden Religious Icons, he tells us new histories that were never told or were perhaps deliberately forgotten. Gafar gives us the visual representation of the inadequacies of the past and gaps in both collective and personal memory, leaving us wondering what else history has left out. We were made aware of all this in 2007 at the Studio Museum where he was in a group show. We were lucky enough to have a friend take us to a studio the very next year when we were able to purchase an amazing work, Revolution, Revolution, depicting a Southern white general with a black fist, one of the most discussed works in our collection. It can be hung right side up or upside down. So the fist is either at the bottom or at the top. It's really an amazing work. And now, 10 years later, we have just purchased, redrafted a, an image of James Madison in a ripped canvas from the Four Freedoms exhibit, the first ever artist super PAC for the 2016 election. As well as being an amazing artist, he is also a committed citizen of New Haven with his project to develop a 20,000 square foot studio space and mentoring programs for graduating MFAs. It is my pleasure to introduce Titus Kafar. And where is he?
Hello. No, for real. Hello. <laughs> okay. So I start my talks the same way every time. And that is, I say, I really don't like doing these. <laughs> and the only way it works for me is if it doesn't feel like a monologue. If it feels like a monologue, I get really, really nervous. And I'll just leave. So if at any point you have a question, uh, ask it. You don't have to raise your hand. Just ask the question. And that way I feel like I'm not alone up here, but we're, we're actually having a conversation. <sighs> Visual quotations. So when people look at my work and they talk about my work, a lot of times they, they talk about it in the context of this sort of like social and political work. And there's a reason for that, and I understand that. But for me, it's, it always comes from a really, really personal place. Some experience that I've had, something that's affected me directly, and I've decided to take it to the studio. Uh, a friend of mine who is a psychiatrist uh, told me, he said, you know, you don't really need a psychiatrist. The studio is your chair. And, uh, and I said, I think, you're, I think you're right, because that's where I go to work out all of, all of the stuff. This was the first body of work that I felt like actually got towards communicating what I was actually trying to say. Everything else was me just trying to understand the medium. And this project started because I was an undergrad at San Jose State. And uh, at San Jose State, we had this art history class. And I love art history. In this art history class, um, I had like one of the best art history professors I had ever had. She was really, really enthusiastic, energetic. She knew all of the stories about all of the artists, and she just really brought the class alive. But when we got halfway through the class, we got to the section in the book, which was black people in art. Now, I saw the section at the beginning of the class and saw the section, and I was like, well, it's a 200-page book, and it is only 14 pages, but hey, it's there, cool. When we got to that section, I got to class, and the teacher said, I have an announcement today. We're not going through this section. We don't have time. And so she skipped over the entire section of the book. Now, I'm the only black student in the class, so I raised my hand. I said, excuse me, excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Professor, I'm really interested in this particular chapter. Um, are we going to come back to it later? Uh, no, Titus, we're not going to come back to it later. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I have another question. Um, are we ever going to have any conversation about the content in that, those chapters? I mean, at all. And she said, Titus, I don't have time for this. Okay, one last question. I'm sorry, one last question. When can we talk about this? Because we need to talk about this. And she said, meet me in my office hours. So I went to her office hours. And I was upset. I'm sorry. I was really, really frustrated. And I didn't handle the situation well. I was a little bit too loud. But at the end of it, I was just saying, this is important to me. I think it's important to everyone else, too. And the last thing she said was, I'm not going to teach it. You can go now. So I went to the dean, and I said, look, I paid for this class. I'm loving what's happening so far. I think I sh should get this information, too. And the dean told me, there's, there's nothing I can do. I can't force her. His exact words were, I can't force her to teach anything. At that moment, I realized whatever history I wanted to know, I was going to have to find it myself. I was going to have to teach myself. And this, this whole body of work was really about teaching myself the history of painting and the role in which black folks played a part in that. This body of work is called Visual Quotations. And I took that section of the book and I repainted every image of a black character in that book and the same compositional size as the original painting, but I removed everything from the painting except for that black figure. So it's floating in this white space. This is uh, a close-up of the image. And the white space you actually see is dry erase whiteboard, which is what we had in the classroom, which is what everything was taught on. So it was, just, it was you know, when I look back at it, I say, you know, it's a little didactic, Titus, but, you know, it was an important body of work for me. It was a really important body of work for me. What size is that image? You asked the question. Thank you so much. Uh, this, this particular image is actually only about this big. Yeah, it's just a relatively small image. This project got me thinking about art in a completely different way. 
Um, I was taking another class at the time, which was a performance class, and I, at that time, didn't believe in performance. I thought it was fake art. I was like, this is ridiculous. This is for people who actually don't know how to paint. And so <laughs> I was taking a class. I had this professor, and she knew that I didn't believe in the class, so she picked on me all the time. All the time she picked on me. And so we had this final project that we had to do for the class. We had to do this like major performance. And I, all I knew was what I was experiencing in that art history class, the class right before this, was the only thing that I could think about. So I did my first performance. What I did was I took that art history book and I put it in the black gallery. Now the black gallery at San Jose State, which is where I went to undergrad in California, was this gallery that was <laughs> all black. It was all black because all of the walls were covered with plywood. They had windows on the outside before, but they covered them all with plywood so that you couldn't see in, so it could be a dark space, primarily used for performance. I brought a classroom desk from that art history class in the middle of the space, and I brought that book that we were looking at in that space. And I sat down in the middle of the classroom, in the middle of this gallery, with one light above me and the book on the desk, and I just started going through the pages and just ripping out pages one by one, one by one, one by one, one by one. And then I get to this section, and I skip over that section, and I start ripping out more pages, ripping out more pages. And at the end of it, all I have is this little pamphlet, this pamphlet of a section. And while I'm ripping out these pages, something is happening. I'm getting really, really angry. I wasn't expecting to be getting as angry as I was getting. I picked up that pamphlet. I got out of the desk, and I walked over to the wall. And without thinking about it, I hit the book against the wall as hard as I could. And the book went through the wall. And all of this light rushed into the gallery. I didn't know how I was going to end that performance, so I just said, I, I think I'm done. <laughs> and I got up, and I walked away, and that was it. That was my entry into performance. I invited the dean. I invited that professor. She didn't show up, by the way. Um, a bunch of other people showed up. Um, I will say she no longer works there. Um, I don't know that that's a great thing. I wish she would have taught that section. Um, imperfect God, national memory. Those are my cues, by the way. Uh, so <laughs> that's how I got really interested in art history. That's, that's the reason why I started looking at art history. Um, I was trying to teach myself because, as I said, I realized that was the only way that I was going to get the information that I needed. But as I was making these pieces, I started to think about this idea that as painters, everything that we do is illusion. If I paint a portrait of you, there's nothing there. It's some oil and some pigment, but there's nothing there physically. So I wanted, I wanted to explore this idea of making the paintings more physical. I had finished this book on George Washington called Imperfect God, and when I started the book, I had all these preconceived notions about what George Washington believed about slavery. I closed the book and realized he was as torn up inside about slavery as anyone of his time. I found that utterly shocking. I closed the book, and my first words were, George, George, George. Like, if you would have said something, like, you, you, you could have done something. They believed in you. Everybody else is having these feelings too, but nobody is saying anything about it. If you had said something, we might be in a very different place right now. And as I was thinking about this piece and I was, I was thinking about this book, I, I wanted to do something that reflected how much chance was involved in politics. And so I started making this piece and cutting it out and, and moving this figure upside down. And, and before I realized it, I had something that looked like a playing card because it felt so much like gambling, but uh, at such a high value, you know, gambling with people's lives ultimately. This, this piece of work continued me deep down this path of thinking about things physically. If I'm talking about torture, I don't want to make a painting about torture. I ask myself the question, what does it mean to torture the painting? 
what does that look like? What is the impact of that? The piece that the Hoffmans have is from, from this body of work right here, which comes from that. Madison was the exact same way as Washington. He was completely torn up by this, and he writes about it a lot. But they weren't strong enough to say, I'm going to let it all go. I'm going to let it all go because this is what I actually feel is true and honest and should be done. <laughs> so I was having a conversation with someone. I'm telling you, all this stuff is personal. <laughs> I was having a conversation with someone, a person I, I actually care very, very deeply for, an individual who's taught uh, American history for over 30 years. And we were sitting down and we were having a conversation about American history. And then, of course, we get into Jefferson. And I love talking about Jefferson. I feel like he's such a con con conflicted individual. Um, and we got into the issue of slavery. When we got into the issue of slavery, she said, yes, but, wow. She said, yes, but Jefferson was a benevolent slave owner. And, and I said, I don't know what that means. <laughs> I have no idea what that means. I, I've never heard anyone say benevolent rapist. I've never heard anyone say benevolent kidnapper. I don't know what you mean by that. And I wasn't trying to be rude. I just wanted to engage the conversation because clearly we see the world in very different ways. So help me understand what you see that I don't see. The conversation didn't go anywhere. She didn't say anything. And so, as always, when I feel conflicted about something, I make my way back to the studio. And this is a piece that came of it. This piece is called The Myth of Benevolence. The Myth of Benevolence. We have all these parts of history that are sort of covered up. We don't like to talk about them so much. It makes us feel really, really uncomfortable. But if we don't have the conversations, in other ways, we're bound to repeat ourselves, right? We all know that. I don't hear any questions. <laughs> Just, that's a good question. Um, that's, uh, that, uh, that piece is about uh, 48 inches tall. It is. It is two canvases. Two canvases. Let's go back here. It's two canvases on top of each other. Um, when I start a painting, I generally have no idea how it's going to end. I, I'll, I may take two um, characters. I know I want to deal with this particular subject matter. And I'll leave them in the, in the studio and wait for them to begin to, I say, talk to each other. And when they talk to each other, they let me know what I'm supposed to do, and then I do it, which is why it's very hard for me to do commissions, because if the painting says do something different than what you commissioned me to do, I'm not going to listen to you. i got to listen to the painting. That's kind of my commitment. So commissions are very, very difficult for me. We'll get into that a little bit later. How long ago was that conversation? That conversation was just a few years ago. Uh, two years. Uh, let me see. The show was two years ago, so the conversation was three years ago. So, so this is this is Jefferson, and uh, we all know about Jefferson and Sally Mae Hemings, right? Right. Um, this is obviously not Sally Mae Hemings because I don't have any sort of documentation of what Sally Mae Hemings was looks like. So I chose an individual to stand in for Sally Mae Hemings. And so I wanted, uh, in, in this particular painting, when I, when I painted her, I wanted her environment to be as lush and beautiful as possible. So I, in fact, put her in a context, and I put her uh, with this band on her that she, she probably would never, ever have. Good question. So... I started working with tar. Um, I was just really fascinated by the material. I was fascinated by all the connotations of the material. And I was also fascinated because the more I started working with the material, the more I realized that it was much more than all of the stereotypes that we use that reference for tar baby and all the like. As I said, all of the work was very personal, is very personal. I found myself going through 
probably one of the, the hardest experiences my wife and I have ever experienced. We, it, it was a very, very difficult thing. I don't talk about it. Um, but I found that the studio, again, working was the only thing in this situation that made me feel like I wasn't gonna go crazy. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna jump forward to this a little bit. But what happened is I started to realize that all of this stuff, this personal stuff, was becoming very public. And there's a lot of writing about how the, how the personal is political and vice versa. Um, but all of a sudden, people started looking at my work. <laughs> Before, I was just in a studio by myself just making stuff that felt important to me. And then all of a sudden, I'm up here in front of all of you people <laughs> talking about these really private conversations that were happening inside of me. I still don't know how to resolve that. <laughs> um, so as of now, I'm just going to continue to be honest and just say what the work is about. But I got to say, it's becoming more difficult. Um, we can go to this. Um, <laughs> it's becoming more difficult because, thank you for asking the question. It's becoming more difficult because I was making this work and I was just making it for myself and close friends. And, and, and then it, it, I'm on this very public stage now. Um, and some of these things that I'm talking about, I was never intending to talk about publicly. Um, it was me going to my, my therapist, as it were, you know? Um, I've tried making work about other kinds of things outside of myself in this way, and I'm never as satisfied with the process. You know, I think free speech is dangerous. It's dangerous in a lot of ways because you do expose your innermost thoughts, and there's a real tension there, I think. I, I'm just throwing that out there. I, I, I appreciate you speaking. Someone else, called me, someone else called me dangerous this week. Um, <laughs> I know what you're saying, though. Yeah, right here. Were they saying things that you were accurately feeling, or were they just projecting your own interpretation of what you were doing? I feel very strongly that once the work is done, once you put it out in the world, you actually have no control over it, right? And people are going to have their own um, conversation, interaction, feeling about the work. I start from a very particular place, a very specific place, but I don't want to burden people with all of that. I, that, that all changed for me um, one of my early exhibitions. I had this exhibition where I painted this portrait of this woman. And in the portrait, the woman's face is very blurred out, but her hands are perfectly realized. They're photographically realized, um, down to the veins that are coming out. The show opens, the painting's sitting on the wall. There's this woman standing in front of the painting opening at six o'clock. Go around, wine and cheese, talking to people, seven o'clock, she's still there. Opening ends at eight o'clock, she's still there. Everyone's leaving. I walk up to her and I, I say, so do you like this painting? She didn't say she liked it. She didn't say she didn't like it. What she said is, my mother died recently and I feel like I'm forgetting her. I can't, I can't remember her face. But her hands, I could never forget her hands. She worked with her hands. That's when everything changed for me. Who cares what I was thinking when I made the piece? Like that impacted her. That was meaningful to her. I, do you think I said, well, actually, what I was thinking when I made the piece was it? No. I was like, that's awesome. That's, that's amazing. Um, we'll, we'll keep the lights on a little bit longer. Stay as long as you want. So that changed a lot for me. That said, I do start from these very personal places. You know, time approached me about a commission. And I already told you, I don't like commissions. And for the same reasons I told you, I told them, I'm not sure I want to do this. And they said, well, what if you did something and we liked it and we used it? And I said, yeah, let's do that. That'll work. So I had already been thinking about these issues the ones that you're going to see in this right here. I'll tell, how you, I'll tell you how it started. I was adopted when I was 15 years old. We'll get into that a little bit later. But my brother, my birth brother, came out to visit my wife and I, my kids. My brother is still in the same neighborhood I grew up in. Neighborhood's very challenged. And when he came to visit, 
it became very clear to me that my brother is interested in two things, tennis shoes and women. That was it. <laughs> He's about 21 years old, and that's all he wanted to talk about. <laughs> I'm already married, <laughs> and I guess I'm mildly interested <laughs> in tennis shoes. So by day three, conversation was really limited. But something happened, and he started to open up and start talking about other things. And it got real for the first time in our relationship. And he said, I want to see your art. Prior to this, this kid has never asked me anything about my work, what I do, or anything like that. But he said, I want to see your art. I said, OK, great. I got to show up in New York. Let's go to New York, because we live in Connecticut. We go to New York, and I'm thinking, we're going to be in the gallery for you know 10 minutes, and then we're going to go do something else. I'm, you know, I'm going to show him New York. 10 minutes, he still wants to look. 20 minutes, he still wants to look. Hour later, he still wants to look. He said, let's go see some other galleries. So we go gallery hopping with my brother who's never been to galleries before, and he's loving it. And I'm just, my, my mind is blown. We're having a great time. We're talking about what this art might mean, what we feel about it, blah, blah, blah. Like conversations that we have never had before. So we leave the last gallery, and we're walking up 10th Avenue between 26th and 27th Street. And as we're walking, I'm talking to him about what my mother told me to talk to him about. She sent him to stay with me because he was getting into trouble. And so I start the conversation. I say, listen, man, mom is really worried about you. She's seen you getting in trouble with these police, and she's concerned that at your age now, you're not a kid. This is not a game. You see all these other guys out here getting shot. This is not, this is not what you want to be doing. Literally, as I'm having that conversation, an undercover police car speeds up to us, and two police officers get out of the vehicle with their hands on their gun and tell us to get against the wall. And I'm like, what is going on here? They said, get against the wall. And I said, what, excuse me, can you, can you explain to me what's going on? They said, are we going to have a problem with you? I said, no, no problem, no problem. They said, give us your ID. I'm getting my ID. I'm getting my ID. It's in my pocket. It's in my pocket. I'm getting my ID. You see, I've been through this before. I know how this works, and I know what happens if I move too quickly. I'm getting my ID. It's in my pocket. I'm getting my ID. I'm handing you my ID. Now, can you please explain to me why you are violating my civil rights? Because I didn't do anything. We'll talk to you in a moment. Now I go to the other police officer. Can you explain to me what's going on? Well, we've heard that there have been this group of black men walking into galleries stealing artwork. I have a show up right now. My work is in the gallery. We've been following you for two hours. You, two, uh, okay, so now I'm upset. Everything that I know that I'm supposed to do in this situation, everything that other older black men have told me to do goes out the window. I'm like, what are you talking about? If you've been following me for two hours, then you know damn well I didn't take anything. So what is this actually about? Nothing. They say nothing. They say nothing. They hand me back my ID, and I will never forget this because I wrote it down in my sketchbook. I almost always have a sketchbook with me. He said, I hope you're never in a situation where you need the police because we just might not be there for you. Whoa. Turned around, got in the car, and walked away. I didn't start this work on the criminal justice system because... It's the thing to do right now. This has been happening to me since, I, since I guess people saw me as some kind of a threat. High school, undergrad, graduate school, it, it keeps happening. I don't think it's the last time. I just hope I keep my cool. So when time came to me and asked me to, to do this commission, I had already been dealing with this content.
So, the only good thing about, look, I'm sure there's a bunch of good things, but one of the really good things about making this personal work, sorry to say, it's not standing up here talking in front of you guys. It's actually when I get to talk to high school kids who actually have been through this, and I can say to them, like, this is the other side of it. This is how you can manage it. This is, this is what I do with all this frustration. We'll get to that a little bit more later. Here's the piece. <laughs> they did. <laughs> my, my mom got a lot of copies. Uh, yeah, they did. <laughs> they did. Um, so the Jerome Project. Uh, another very, very personal project that was considered very political, and I guess it is to a certain degree, because the Jerome Project is an investigation into the criminal justice system through the name Jerome. As I told you, I was adopted when I was 15. I left my father's house when I was 15, and the day that I decided to leave my father's house was the day that I saw him hit a woman across the room, she fell into a mirror, and I helped her get off the ground, picked the glass out of her back, and told him that I didn't want to see him again. I told him, I don't need to know you. I don't need to be around you. I can't stand you. That was the day I decided to leave. It took me a little while after that, but I got out. So as I look back on my work over the years, uh, I realized I have this really deep interest in erasure, absence, holes in narratives, the family stories that we don't, we don't like to talk about so much. When I started this project, I started it because, as I said, my father's name is Jerome. And when I went back to Michigan to visit my grandmother after having been gone for a while, I took my kids with me. My father showed up at the doorstep when I was walking into my grandmother's house. I had my two sons with me, and he wanted to talk. I hadn't had a conversation with this man in a very, very long time. I said, this is not an appropriate time. I don't really want to do this right now. I'm really not interested in having this conversation right now. And I'll try my best to get out of the conversation. I walk in the house. To my surprise, he follows us in the house, my grandmother's house, and he really wants to have this conversation. My grandmother wants me to have the conversation, and I'm not one to argue with my grandmother. Um, so I come up with a strategy, and my strategy is this. If you want to have this conversation, I get to record you. Because, of course, he's going to say no to that, right? He's going to say no. Who wants to be recorded when you know the kinds of questions that I'm going to ask? He said, great, be there in 15 minutes. I said, well, that did not work the way I planned it. <laughs> I went to his house thinking I was going to be there for 10 minutes, and I ended up there recording for three days. I went back three days in a row. Because for the first time, I, I, I heard my, story, my father's story within the context of deindustrialization, because I had a little Yale education now. I saw my father's story within the context of the influx of crack cocaine into my little community in Michigan. All of a sudden, I saw my father's story within the context of the criminal justice system and mass incarceration. All of those speeches that I had prepared all of these years for him to deliver just didn't make sense anymore because I was looking at talking to a person in a very, very different place. So I went to his house and I started recording. Um, I'll tell you more about, more about that after. <laughs> What's your name? My name is Jerome. And what is your relation to the documentarian? He's my son. He's my oldest child. I began to rebel against what God was calling me.
I got on drugs. I, Who can think straight on drugs? You get a different priority. What? And then I left. You become selfish. I left and I was gone for a, a, another 15 years. I know. I had a choice, but I didn't have a choice because my choices were limited because of the things and people that were around me. After that, there were no other choices for me but to deal with my own mess that I had made. I had to go through that valley until I could come up out of that jungle. I was tired of running from them. I started running towards them. They started running from me. What do you think I was doing while you were doing that? Being covered under gray. Because every night and every morning I was praying. That's the that problem. God hold, would on, watch hold on. Watch over hold on, hold and on. keep That's my the arrows. problem. That's the problem. That's the problem. What's the problem? Like, I, I can't say that. I can't say covered under gray. It's I not, can't it's say not, that. It's not that you can't say that. That's not it. But what it does is it neglects the reality of, frankly, the shit I was going through. My life just got turned upside down. He put such an impression on me. What do you mean? What do I mean? Daddy scared me. I was very scared of my father. Why? Why? Yeah. Homie didn't play that. If you didn't get in line, you take it out, he put you in line. That's why it's hard to call you dad. Why I keep saying Jerome, because I'm like, I feel torn. I feel torn because when I needed you to be there, you took off and left. Tell me more about your dad. In my old age, I say daddy displaced. He misplaced anger. I know so much of me is in you. I know so much of you is in me. I, 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 I can't fight that. I'm not trying to fight that. We, 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 we're gonna take a while, we're gonna work through our stuff. I'm committed to that. I wouldn't have had you here if I'm not committed to that. I, I hear you, I hear you. And, and I'm realizing more and more as you grow, the devastation that took place in you. So, I'm not a filmmaker. <laughs> it wasn't my intention to become a filmmaker. I took those, that footage of my father and I had it on a laptop uh, in my studio. And my friend Horacio, uh, who is a filmmaker, he's a cinematographer, um, he, he came in the studio one day and he, he saw a screenshot that I was taking because I was looking at it. And he said, what's this? And I said, ah, this is nothing. <laughs> he said, what's this? And I said, well, I'll show you, and I showed him. And he said, you need to make a movie. And I said, I don't, I don't know how to do that. He said, I'll help you. Um, and I said, eh, I don't think that's gonna be enough. He said, you should apply for a grant. So I said, okay, great. I'll apply for creative capital, because I hear it takes a really long time to get that. Like, people you know, apply seven times and they'll get it. I apply and I get it the first time. I'm like, damn, this is not working. <laughs> so I'm starting to realize that maybe I'm supposed to make this film. And so right now, I'm in the process of finishing this film right now. We're, we're cutting all of the footage, and yeah, that's, that's the drone, the drone project. <laughs> the painting that I was working on in the studio ultimately became this. Uh, this one, is, this is of my father, and this is of my cousin. I started this body of work where I was looking at these mug shots from these men online, from these different databases of these men who had the same name as my father. First and last name, I should say. Um, and all of them were black men, all of them were stuck in the same criminal justice system, and I just started painting them. I started painting these mugshots that were so available online, 
And so I, I painted them as these very small devotional paintings because I thought, as a society, I don't think we're so devoted to that particular population. And, and then I took the paintings and I started to submerge them in tanks of tar based on um, how much of their life was lost to the criminal justice system. Um, this was for my cousin. He died in prison. This is all personal for me. I don't do this for the politics of it. I, it's hard because I know that we are talking about these very political things, but I hope by the end of this conversation you understand that's not my motivation for doing anything. These are just some. So, as I said, one of the things that is really exciting for me is being able to work with kids who have had similar life experiences to mine. Um, my life changed dramatically when I was 15 years old. I'm not going to get into the whole thing, but I was living in a basement with my father, and his addiction had gotten to the point where it was just unmanageable. And I was, I was terrified. One day, my mom comes from the shelter that she was at. She picks me up and says that we're going to California. We go to California, and we meet this family, this Haitian, Im Haitian immigrant family, and it blows my mind, completely blows my mind. I'm now in a completely different context. I was all in a black neighborhood before growing up, very poor neighborhood. Now I'm in a middle-class neighborhood where the only other black family around is this other Haitian family. I start getting into trouble in the ways that I tend to get into trouble. And I meet this young black kid who's the only other black kid. And unfortunately, I start getting him into a little bit of trouble too. But rather than his father saying, stay away from my son, his father said, come hang out with us. You need somebody. <laughs> you need somebody. That man changed my life. And it was one person making a decision that changed my life. He didn't start some program, some project. He just said, come on in. That was it. I would not be in this situation. I would not be here able to articulate myself in the way that I am if it wasn't for my dad. That's kind of what makes the drone project so complicated. That's why I was saying it's hard to call you dad. I can't call you dad because somebody else came in and did a damn good job of taking care of me when I needed them to be there. So I've started working with high school kids, college kids, any opportunity I can get to work with kids who have had the same life experiences as mine. Trying to show them that all of that that's going on inside of you, you can make that productive. There's a way that you can make that productive. And so I started working on this project called the Postmasters Project where we are, we are working initially, let me step back, it's a tiered mentorship system where professional artists like myself are mentoring recent graduates and those recent graduates are mentoring high school students. And these high school students get jobs. They get to work in the studio with us. They get paid to learn how to stretch canvas, how to clean brushes, all the, all the sort of fundamental baseline stuff of making art. And they're introduced to this process of making art, this thing that is so important to me and a, in, a, in a very unique, unique way. In fact, I guess it's not that unique because it's the way that it used to happen. Apprenticeships, that's how it worked. So even right now, I have three high school kids that I work with. A couple from next door who were just on the block one day and I said, which one of you guys wants to work? Like, I see you on the block every day and nobody's going, who wants to work? And to my surprise, they all raised their hand. And I was like, ah, okay, we'll see. I bring them in the studio and they work and they work hard and they're proud of themselves when they get done. I say this all the time, but if at the end of the day, the only thing people say about me is that I was a really good painter, I feel like I failed at my life. If that's all my kids can say about me, I failed. I wanna do things that matter. That's the reason why I keep engaging this kind of work, as painful as it is to be up here talking in front of all of you, that's the reason I keep doing what I'm doing. So all of these projects, 
are interconnected. I was going to talk about the building a little bit, but I'm really not. I'm not going to do that right now. If you want to know more about that, um, you can come back to me later. <laughs> okay. So all of this stuff is connected. <laughs> all of it is connected. I had to make this diagram so that I could actually see how it was connected. Because sometimes I start this new body of work and I'm like, this has nothing to do with the last thing you did. But when you sit down and look at it as a whole, I actually now see how, how it all interconnects. It's all personal. It's all based on things that I've experienced. What was the first my kids, my wife. <laughs> She's right there. <laughs> um, my, I mean, I'm really excited. I, that sounds trite. I'm really excited about being a dad. I really, really am. Because I get to do it differently than it was done before. And so introducing my kids to new experiences, taking them to places like this, places I'd never been to at their age, um, that's really exciting. Working with other kids who, who have had difficult upbringings, but I can see in them something really strong and somebody just needs to help them pull it out, that really excites me. It's hard, but it really excites me. Pardon me? is not about excitement. I don't, I don't go to the studio because I'm excited. I go to the studio because I, I have to. I go to the studio because that's where I work out this stuff. It's really not exciting. Some of this is not exciting at all. Some of this is very painful. Some of this sucks. <laughs> like, honestly, just flat out sucks. Like, I do it because I have this need. My wife says it all the time. She can see it. When you haven't been in the studio, you act differently. Go to the studio. Get out of here. Go paint. Go. You, 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 ha you need that. You need that. Pardon me? That's my couch. That's my couch. So it's not at all about excitement. It really isn't. Not even a little bit. So my wife and I went to Santa Cruz. <laughs> I answer everything with the, with the story. My wife and I went to Santa Cruz, and we were walking around one day. And this was before we had kids. And we're walking around, and we walk in this building, and we see these Buddhist monks making this sand drawing. Yeah. And she left, and I stayed there looking at these guys making this amazing thing. Weeks and weeks. And then what do they do? They blow it away. I'm standing there watching them blowing away going, what are you doing? I'm the, obviously, I'm the only person here that this is the first time that they're seeing this, but I'm disturbed. I am very disturbed. Why are you guys blowing this away? This was amazing. So I didn't hear that last part. Yeah. That's the sacrifice. You know, what I've realized is it's not about the amount of time that I put in it. It's that I put my whole self into it. Because you can make a great painting in a, in a day. You can make a great drawing in a couple of seconds. Um, but when I put my whole self into it, and I'm, I'm still willing to sacrifice it to get to this other thing at the end, that's when the work gets good. To me, that's when the work gets good. No problem. So... I mean, no, it's not a bad question. It's not a bad question. It's, I mean, it's a question that, like, the work sort of uh, calls out. Uh, I wish my brother was doing better. Um, uh, he was just in jail. Um, and uh, I've tried um, and tried and tried and tried. And, you know, the reason my life changed, and this goes back to the mentorship thing, the reason my life changed is because someone was able to take me up out of the situation that I was in and show me something completely different. 
unfortunately, my brother and I are close enough in age that he's already grown, right? It's not like a 15-year-old boy that you can take in and raise. So I try to, I try to do as much as I possibly can in terms of in terms of like inspiration, in terms of having him come out, I actually helped him start his own business, but then he let it go. And then, so um, it's challenging. It's really challenging. We're still really close, um, but yeah, it's it's hard. It's very hard. In the mentoring program, how frequent or long or how much involvement over a period of time have you or other artists been able to spend with kids and what kind of an impact, what things do you see that you're doing have on them long term? What are you seeing? Um, so the one student, uh, Tyler, I've been working with Tyler for almost a year now actually. I did this Jerome Project project where I invited a bunch of high school students into a, um, a not-for-profit art gallery and introduced them to the content. And we specifically focused on students who, whose family members were either in jail or they themselves had had some, some experience in the criminal justice system. And by the end of the three-week project that we did with this class, um, all of the students, I wish I had the video, all of the students were talking about how they feel like now they have a way to deal with some of this stuff that they don't feel like they can talk about to other people. You know, so many people have a family member in the criminal justice system, but everybody's ashamed to talk about it. Nobody wants to talk about it. So now what I see as a result is they're beginning to talk about it. Tyler is making work. Tyler is the student who actually, his mother came to me and said, can he work with you anyway? I don't care what he does, just like, can he work with you? And I said, sure, of course. And he brought, I brought him in the studio. So he, I, Tyler's gonna be fine. He has parents who, who are really committed to his well-being. Um, some of the other kids I worry about a little bit more. Um, but an ability to express themselves, I'm not, like I said, my dad didn't do some big, crazy project. He just brought me in to see something. When I walk into a high school in, in the neighborhoods that I walk into, you can see the shock in the kids' eyes. You can see it. Because when I begin to say I'm a professional artist, they don't even think that they're, they don't even think professional artist is a thing that exists anymore, number one, and definitely not a black professional artist. That's just outside of their realm of reality. So all of a sudden, just by entering into the room, I've opened up the possibility for them. I think that I'm not, I, I'm not trying to like, I don't know, there's a lot of projects that are doing a lot of different things. I'm trying to keep it really, really focused and really, really simple. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, were you raising your hand? You can do more. That's a good question. Um, she said, you can, you can repeat yourself. Is it really cool to think about everything that you've done for these kids? Or do you always think about that you could do more? That's a good question. Um, I actually don't really think in terms of what I've done for the kids. I always feel like I can do more. I mean, you can ask my wife about that. I always feel like really guilty, like, man, I could be doing this or I could be doing that or maybe maybe we should do this or maybe we should invite them to stay with us and like da 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 da, da. And it's just like <laughs> she's always dealing with that with me. So, no, I, I'm usually thinking about what else I could do. Because um, I know that I know that mentorship works. I know that working with people one-on-one -on -one like this actually works. So, good question. Are they? You tell me, are they? I think maybe we have, I think we maybe have uh, Romir Bearden and Jacob Lawrence, and those are probably the two that people talk about, but contemporary artists alive in public schools? Not? Pardon me? 
Oh, there's tons. Oh, don't get me wrong, but David Hammonds was not in any book that I, I mean, do you know who David Hammonds is? You might. I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know. My experience is, is the art classes that I've been to, that's not the subject. Those are not the folks that talk, especially not contemporary, not David Hammonds for sure, for sure. He's too complicated. Um, in, in other places, it's different though. Yeah. What do you think is needed to improve the situation? You, you are so dying to answer that question. I can see it through the glasses. I want to say this, though. Let me say this, though. Let me say this. It's a new day, but I want you guys to turn around and look at each other. Okay? I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm not saying you're wrong. But every time I give this talk, this is what my audience looks like. Okay? So it's a new day, but we ain't there yet. So I, 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 I didn't say we were there. No, no, I no. I said no. it's a I, new day. I, yeah, totally. I totally agree with you. We day. argue a lot, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> it's, it's a beautiful new day. It, not only is it a good day, but it, it's a beautiful new day. But you do have a lot of collectors here who do collect. Uh, who Absolutely. For many years collected African-American art. And Absolutely. continue to do so. Not because it's African-American, but because the art, it, art, black art is emerging. And uh, people like you are graduating from great schools with great educations and doing powerful, meaningful, personal art. And great art, by the way, as far as I'm concerned, is always personal. So you're not doing anything special as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> um, you always want a box. I, I you <laughs> always want a box. No, I mean, have you ever seen a good work of art that isn't personal? Yeah, there's a question in the back. It used to frustrate me a lot. It used to frustrate me a lot. But then I started talking to older artists, and they're the ones that told me, you have no control of that. Like, you make the work that you have to make. You, once, once it's out of your studio, there's nothing else that you can do about it. So you have to learn how to let it go. Because if, if you bring that stuff into the studio with you, it'll mess up the work. It really will. So I, 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 I can't pretend like it doesn't have any effect on me, but I try very much to leave that stuff outside of the studio. I have uh, two smaller questions. Sure. You know, I had asked my one big one. Uh, first one being, uh, where, would, where would you see yourself if you didn't have that opportunity when you were 15 to be taken out of your situation and put it somewhere completely different? Just, I guess, entertain me. Where would you see yourself actually? What would you see yourself doing? Where would you see yourself being? What kind of person do you think you would be? And my second question is, uh, why do you think that you latched on to visual art instead of any other type of art? So say musical or performance or something else. Um, so remember that painting I showed you and I said the one on the side is my cousin? Yes. We grew up together. That was like my little brother. I can't see that I'd be in any different situation. I don't see why I would be in any different situation. Probably covered in tar. I don't see why it'd be any different situation. As far as why I went into visual arts, um, uh, kind of because my wife, actually. She wasn't my wife at the time. Um, she doesn't like when I tell the story, but I'm going to tell the story. And this is the last story I'm telling. It's very quick. Okay. So uh, I liked her. <laughs> I wanted to date her, but I'm four years younger than her. And her comment was something along the lines of, you're not even really thinking about your future right now. I just graduated from college. I said, okay. More or less immediately, I registered for junior college, registered for classes, came to her and said, I'm thinking about my future. <laughs> and we started this dating at that time. And I, I ended up signing up for an art history class, not really knowing what art history was, but showed up to the class and I got a B plus in that class. Now, let me tell you something. In high school, my GPA was 0.65. That was my GPA in high school. I failed at everything. I failed at everything. <laughs> I, I, I had already internalized this idea that I was somehow a failure. 
And so when I got to that class and all of a sudden my visual intelligence was required of me, it blew my mind. Because I can look at that and go, of course that's a Monet. Can't you tell by the way that he uses the whites? Of course that's Picasso. Can't you see by the, like I could do that all day. So I was successful at it. And essentially what I realized is I'm a visual learner. If I can see it, I can figure it out. I wasn't good at painting. I have my first sketchbook. I was terrible. I was really, really bad. No one believes me. I didn't start painting until I was 27 years old. But when I found it, I never stopped. And I felt like I'm getting better. I'm getting better. I'm getting better. Even when I wasn't really getting better, I felt like I was getting better. And so I felt positive for the first time. That's the only reason I did it. Anyway, that's it. So Titus, wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry. I kept raising my hand oh, and I'm I sorry. have it's, to speak up. Sure. It's Katie Kitchen. We'll my say name is yes. Katie Kitchen, but <laughs> I want to say one thing. Sure. What you have done here today for all of us is so commendable. No matter what type of an artist are, you brought your authentic self and you have shared with us something that we have to continue to look at at this country because it's a shame of what is going on, what has gone on. And I wish there was a way that we had to face this all the time at this point because I don't think it's enough to have one or two artists like yourself speak to us, but we must keep the dialogue alive and may there be other students here to hear your work and not just us who are, you know, able to be here. But I'm so grateful you go into the classrooms and may we have more and more programs for students who can hear you and hear the passion of the personal story that you share. I think we are all so grateful for what you've brought to us today. I never imagined to leave here with the passion and the heart <laughs> and the, to be so inspired to see what one man can do with his work. I commend you all so much. I appreciate <laughs> that. Thank you. Well, thank you, Katie. Thank you, Titus. And I'm so pleased to tell you, Katie, that Anderson Ranch and its board of trustees has just adopted a long-range plan that has a focus on diversity. So as we look around this room in the next, in the coming years, we're going to see some changes. Uh, but thank you. And thank you, Titus, for sharing your personal self. <laughs>